Okay, welcome back. We're now heading into the home stretch of today. Uh, interest is not flagging. Uh, the session we're about to have is a little different from the previous one. It's called Lightning Talks, Innovative Models for Climate Solutions. And we have uh, five uh, very distinguished panelists who are going to come up and very briefly lay out what they are doing in their work. And I think this is the only group that's actually allowed to have uh, slides, and they're only allowed two each if they want them. And I think some of them have them and some of them don't have them. So they're actually going to come up here and they go so that if they need to, they can look back and actually see the slides. But I think we can also see them down here. I don't know about you, but I have found today um, really extremely energizing. Um, uh, it would be impossible to have sat here today until now and not fe felt, you know, an amazing sort of opportunity out there. I mean, speaker after speaker has made the point that actually it can be done. And, and the reason we're here and the reason we're continuing today and tomorrow is because it's happening. It's not yet happening enough. And, and the idea is to share ideas so that we go out more invigorated and actually cross a, a, a tipping point. Uh, one lesson that's come through to me very clearly today, and I guess it's fairly obvious, um, is that there are generally no silver bullets. Um, if, if you want a sports analogy, it's, you know, it's not a rifle that if you only find the right gun and you find the right bullet, you will actually get the prize. Um, if, the, if there is a sport, I think it's more like a jigsaw puzzle, actually. You need to put the different pieces together, and it's only when you manage to put them together at the right time that actually then it falls into place and the picture becomes clear. And speaker after speaker has made that point implicitly, I think, when, when um, I mean, amazing how much public and private. Um, amazing how much we need the technologists, but then we also need the financiers. And I suspect all of us in this room are involved in sort of some jigsaw puzzle or other. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that today. As I was listening, I was thinking of one that, that we're involved in. Um, I'm the president and CEO of, uh, of the World Resources Institute. And we and others over the last year have been working on the subject of restoration of land. Um, we've talked a lot today about energy, but actually the solutions apply just as much in rural areas to trees and bushes and soils. And increasingly over time, it's become clear that the two billion hectares in the world that are currently degraded, and actually that's twice the size of China, and actually serving very little ecological or economic use, that actually if we could restore them, it'd be great for poverty reduction, it'd be great for for economic growth, it'd be terrific for food security, and by the way, it would suck down carbon and go quite a long way to filling the carbon gap. So more and more countries have been saying yes, and the scientists have been showing that it actually makes sense in every agroecological zone. The economists have been showing it makes economic sense. The social scientists have been showing it makes social sense. The question is, why has it not been happening? And just in the last year, for example, in Latin America, we and others got together eight countries to commit to restore 20 million hectares. A political commitment. We mapped the land. We showed it could be done. But then the question is, okay, who finances it? We then got a group of about eight impact investors. And we heard today at lunch from the Athelia Foundation, and it's one of them, uh, to say, actually, we'd be willing to put in $700 million into that, um, but actually, there are certain risks we need addressed. So then the Inter-American Development Bank and the CAF, they said, wait a minute, we're actually quite good at putting together risk management systems. And today, at the Global Environment Facility, at the council meeting, they're receiving a proposal from the Inter-American Development Bank in order to finance that. So you've got a global fund putting a modest amount of money into a, a multilateral bank who will be supporting impact private investors to actually work with the developers, the farmers, with the political support. And that's an example of the jigsaw puzzle having to come together. And what we're going to do now is hear from some really wonderful speakers, uh, some of whom are going to talk about financing and others who are going to talk about uh, from their own sort of individual perch. I'm going to start with, um, with uh, uh, Drew Faust, who is president of Harvard University, and it is a, a real great honor to have you here, President Faust. I think all of us in this room uh, know who you are. Um, now, uh, President Faust is actually not a financier. She is a history professor 
um, and a specialist in the Civil War. So maybe you could give some insights into the intellectual civil war that's going on with regard to climate change, but I don't think that's what you'll be doing. She's written lots of really interesting books, six unbelievable books, the most recent of which has been made into a, a, a movie. It won the Bancroft Prize. It was listed by the New York Times as one of the ten best books of the year. So please all read it, and it's about death in the civil war. That She's not going to talk about death now. You're going to bring life because what Harvard University is doing on climate change is actually quite remarkable. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, President Faust. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Steer. It's really an honor to be here, and I thank Secretary Kerry and the State Department for putting this event together. Dr. Steer spoke about pieces of the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle, and what I'd like to speak about for a few moments is universities as a piece of the puzzle to offer solutions to these very important, urgent problems of climate change and environment that we all face. Universities have a number of roles to play, and I want to list some of those and give you some examples of how those um, engagements are operating at Harvard University. And the first of these is, of course, that universities are creators of knowledge. We contribute to the extraordinary depth and breadth of expertise around topics related to climate. And we produce ideas and discoveries that can be the basis for addressing these kinds of challenges. We've got a lot of work going on in the climate area across a variety of fields at Harvard, ranging from the scalability of electrical vehicles to uh, work on renewable energy sources, batteries that can store renewable energy, research efforts at nano, micro, macro levels for fuel cells from a lithium, lithium ion battery the size of a grain of sand to high energy density batteries that address the shortcomings of current technology. Now these kinds of innovations operate alongside disruptions as well. It's been said that if applied science creates new products, basic science creates new industries. So we see the obligation to ask really big questions that may change the whole structure of how we're thinking about the problems before us as part of our remit as well. I'm thinking about individuals at Harvard who are working to coax living bacteria to generate electricity in microbial fuel cells or to convert solar energy into hydrogen with the help of a bionic leaf. Hydrogen that is later converted into isopropanol with the help again of bacteria. Now these kinds of ideas may sound like the stuff of science fiction, but we see them as the beginning of a chain of innovations and discoveries that can lead to long-lasting and significant impact on the environmental challenges before us. So universities are discoverers and creators of new ideas. They are also educators, preparing generations of leaders to ask and also to answer big questions and to grapple with the very complex problems before us. Our students are exhilarated by the challenges of climate change. And we see both graduate and undergraduate students rushing to study areas from the social sciences through the natural sciences that can help them be part of the army that is going to take on these problems. We have 243 courses at Harvard that are offered on some aspect of energy sustainability or the environment. And we offer both a new undergraduate minor and a graduate certificate um, colloquium kind of uh, endeavor by graduate students across fields to specialize and to indicate their specialization in these fields. We see things like Harvard Law School, for example, with a very innovative environmental law and public policy clinic that has drawn students from well beyond the law school, from public health, from the business school, from other schools across Harvard to work on responses to the Deepwater Horizon spill to consider effective transportation sector policies, 
to produce model legislation to facilitate carbon capture and sequestration, and also to, in a very specific local way, to advise the city of Boston on how to set up the regulatory frameworks to manage climate change. We see at Harvard Business School a sizable proportion of the students wanting to have work and do work on climate and environment. About, let's see, 291 students in the class of 2017, the MBA class, said they were interested in environmental issues, and um, that's almost 30% of the class, and 60% of the class enrolled in an elective focused on environment and business. These are the individuals who will be sitting in your chairs tomorrow. These are the individuals who can lead us forward through the years to come. At our School of Public Health, a student named Catlin Powers developed something called Soul Source, which is a solar-powered, emission-free cooker that not only reduces indoor emissions, which is particularly important to public health in the developing world especially, but also holds the potential to produce clean energy that goes well beyond cooking needs. I have been very um, interested in this development since I heard about it soon after returning from a trip to India, where the impact of cooking um, with wood in so many locations around India obviously has such an impact on the environment and the air, and this um, invention by a student um, is a direct response to that. So we see creating opportunities for students both to participate in creating solutions, but also to learn how to assume leadership roles in taking up the mantle of this uh, effort in the future is critical. We also see universities as conveners places that, and institutions that can bring together people and organizations from different sectors for deep engagement and partnership. Here we might consider, for example, the outsized role that the built environment plays in consuming and, in many instances, wasting energy. The Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities partners with cities and governments and brings together scholars and practitioners of design, of engineering, of law, public health, public policy, of arts and sciences to address and lead change about how people think about sustainable construction. And this is knowledge that can be used from um, Alexandria to Adelaide to Mexico City to every part of the world. We also see at Harvard Business School um, convening around issues of the environment through the creation of cases, more than 140 now cases used by Harvard and other business schools that examine the issues confronting business in relationship to environmental problems and how to drive economic growth and sustainability simultaneously. And finally, universities are collaborators, working with the support of industry and the philanthropic community to advance solutions to climate change. We've seen a new grid scale flow battery developed by a pair of faculty in chemistry and material sciences that can store electricity generated from renewable energy sources. Now this was funded through the Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy and funded by the Harvard Physical Sciences and Engineering Accelerator, which is an internal mechanism designed to bring promising research to market more quickly. And there's now a startup that's based on the technology platform called Green Energy Storage that's beginning to commercialize products. So you can see there a relationship between government, universities, and industry for, to bring forward this very promising innovation. Across Harvard, there's a lot of interest in research on food waste and thinking about is there any way to develop an effective and sustainable biofuels market? How do we assess uh, extreme temperature? Um, we have a number of efforts around market-based solutions to energy problems in the developing world. All of the initiatives that I just mentioned are supported by a new climate change solutions fund a philanthropic effort that we have highlighted in order to provide seed money and encouragement for development of uh, more promising and innovative ideas. 
And just last week, we announced a new $3.75 million research initiative in China uh, focused on climate change in alliance with 150 scholars there, more than 15 Harvard faculty will be working to develop solutions that depend not just on the sciences, but also engineer, uh, um, engineering, economics, law, policy, the wide range of fields in which universities uh, have strength and capacity. This was funded by a philanthropic gift, and so we are delighted to be able to bring forward this um, cross-border collaboration, cross-border in two senses, crossing borders of fields and crossing borders of nationalities. I think that universities, perhaps more than any other institutions, have a remarkable power to convene individuals across these kinds of borders of nations, fields, and generations to address problems that are going to require the input of every possible resource at our command. And so I am very excited about the kinds of research that is going on at Harvard and about what we are going to see in the future. I began by saying universities had a role to play in developing solutions to climate change. Actually, they have many roles to play as creators, conveners, uh, educators, collaborators, and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists and having a chance to, to discuss with all of you how universities can play the most um, important role possible and the most useful role possible as we all work together to address these very significant and urgent challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, President Faust, that was, uh, that was a terrific, terrific uh, start for us. We now turn to Peter Davidson. Uh, he's uh, uh, just about leaving the uh, Department of Energy where he's been overseeing the, the loan program, $30 billion, which makes it, I guess, the largest uh, financing loan program uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, go government. Um, in that context, he financed the first offshore wind uh, uh, program, uh, the first nuclear plant for 30 years. Um, and, and prior to this, he was uh, head of uh, economic development for the New York State. And he's about to take on a new job, and he's going to tell us about it right now. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and it's great to be here. First, let me just say I left the Department of Energy three months ago because it would be a clear violation of federal policy to be negotiating a new job while you were still a federal employee. <laughs> so I was well out of federal employ uh, when this job came about. So as Secretary Ken, uh, Kerry mentioned this morning, we are launching the Aligned Intermediary Venture right now, right here. So we thank you very much for being part of it. So what is it? The Aligned Intermediary is a foundation-backed venture that works on behalf of our large-scale, long-term investor partners. These partners have committed $1.2 billion initially, and we're working with them to clearly identify and then determine how to overcome the particular issues and roadblocks that are slowing their deployment of their corpuses into three areas, clean water, clean waste, and clean energy. So we are really working on behalf of our long-term investor partners to help speed the flow of capital into these sectors. If we are to have a chance of limiting temperature rises to two degrees, the U.S. government estimates that over $40 trillion needs to be deployed over the next 20 years globally. That's $2 trillion per year to decarbonize and uh, redevelop our energy generation and our energy distribution systems. The only place that this amount of money is available on the planet is on the balance sheets of the global long-term investors, pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, and family offices. The Aligned Intermediary Venture was created to assist these long-term investors deploy their accumulated capital into market rate low carbon uh, transactions. So I'll talk more about that, but I'm joined here today 
by many of our long-term investors and by the foundations that have helped launch this. So two slides. Here's the first one, if you can see that. Okay. So this effort uh, began six months ago, um, or, or began with an event at the White House in June, when the five institutions came to met together to provide commitments of $1.2 billion. The initial institutions are the University of California Regents with a $500 million commitment, the New Zealand Superfund, $350 million, the Alaska Permanent Fund, $200 million, TIA CREF, $100 million, and a family office, Tamarisk, for $10 million. So it's, we very importantly want to have all different asset classes and type of investors uh, involved, and we have this committed capital. But the, the idea was the capital is there from the long-term investors. How do we make sure we do the right type of deep analysis and deep dive to really work with our long-term investors to understand the structural issues that are impeding their being able to invest uh, in companies, either invest as equity investors or to provide loans as lenders. So four foundations became involved with us, the Hewlett Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Climate Works and Planet Heritage pooled some money together for the purpose of doing a six to nine month deep dive and exploration, which at the end of that we will come out with really the entity which will be the aligned intermediary. So we are officially launching that six to nine month period, and, and that is what I was just hired to be the CEO of um, 10 days ago. So I'm new to it, but the, the four of the sponsors who really created this are, are in the audience, and I'd just like to, to give them a shout out. It's Ashley Monk, uh, Alicia Seiger, Sarah Kearney, and Tracy Durning, who are really the inspiration uh, for that. So thank you for that. And so this is the process. Over the next nine months, we'll be building the organization, doing the research, and we really will be talking with many more uh, long-term investors. And that's really one of the things we want to communicate today that we have started with these five long-term investors, but we are really building this up as a resource to the investing community of how they can be putting money to work in this area. So we look, greatly look forward to speaking with, with many investors uh, today. So speak to me or anybody else on the AI team. Very briefly, because we're trying to move this along, and that chart is completely illegible, but I will tell you a little bit of what we are hoping to do. Um, so we hope to catalyze the movement of billions of dollars from long-term investors into these three areas, clean water, clean waste, and clean energy. We will facilitate direct equity and debt investments to companies and projects that are all working in the area of a low-carbon future and working on low-carbon transactions. We will focus exclusively on market-based solutions. This is not concessionary capital and it's not subsidized capital. We believe fundamentally that because of the growth dynamics of these areas, clean water, clean waste, uh, and renewable energy, and low carbon energy, these are growth markets, and thus on a risk-adjusted basis, there are better returns to be made in this area than, uh, than many other forms of investment. So we also will look to provide capital for all stages of a company's or project's growth, equity capital initially, growth capital, and then debt to, to make that happen, particularly to each transaction. So what we hope to do, we're beginning by understanding deeply, by working with our long-term investors, the current roadblocks that are preventing them from getting their capital to work. This may be some things like just on their staffs, they don't have the deep domain expertise in say clean water projects. So if there's a way we can be of assistance in helping to vet deals. Another way could be so many deals are not structured correctly from the deal side, the banking side, to make them investable transactions, either on the debt or equity side. So we may be working to really help structure deals that they're bankable or investable. So that is the goal for the next six months. And then uh, in mid-2016, we will be formally launching uh, the entity. And I'd just like to say, because we are really running out of time, that this is the beginning this is a process. We hope to make it a very collaborative process, and we really look forward to um, working with all of the investors or potential investors, because uh, we'd very much like to enter dialogue with you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Peter. So that was it. You launched it. We should have, we should have had a ribbon or something. And I, I, I hope you're going to be serving champagne outside. But this really is a very exciting venture, I think, and we look forward to following with you. We're going to open the floor to questions a little bit later, and so people may want to grill Peter on, on this. We next turn to Afsane Beshlos, who's known to many people here. She's the CEO of the Rock Creek Group, uh, which is a, an investment firm that specializes in the emerging and developing world. Uh, before that, she was treasurer and chief investment officer of the World Bank, where uh, she uh, allocated $65 billion, I guess, and uh, she raised $30 billion a year, and she had $160 billion of derivatives and, uh, and structured products. So she's good at money, and uh, she's going to uh, uh, tell us what's on her mind right now. From my standpoint, I'm delighted she's a board member of the World Resources Institute, and she is chair of the Global Advisory Group for WRI, so Afsani. All yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Andrew. It's great to be here. And um, I'm very excited to, to be following uh, President uh, Fast and Peter. And also wanted to add my thanks to Secretary Kerry and to President DeJoya this morning for launching this event. I think the timing could not be more interesting given everything that we've been hearing today and everything that's been going on moving towards Paris. Um, what I wanted to talk uh, and touch upon for a few minutes is a little bit of sort of um, related, I think, very much to what you just heard. At uh, WRI, as um, you heard from Andrew, I chaired the Global Advisory Council. And we came up, literally, we had a meeting in, on October 5 with the board and with many stakeholders, investment people, um, academics, others interested in uh, climate change and more broadly the topics that we research on, on water, forests, uh, land and other areas. And um, we had a very interesting discussion of the supply and demand. Why are investors not investing in these areas uh, in terms of demand? And for those who do have a demand, how do you get a supply of uh, investable areas? And we decided in this meeting to come up with a menu of projects that are also um, very marketable. And that is very much based on um, WRI's unique blend of research, relationships with corporates, with NGOs, with investors, public policy, government, academics and really collaborating with the groups that have been formed already or are just being announced today, and, um, and really taking advantage of the great interest in the topic that we're discussing today to come up with sort of a project which we call Millions to Trillions. And the reason we're talking about that is that you heard from Peter, there's $74 trillion worth of institutional assets out there based on you know, best estimates we can find. There's another 260 billion. Uh, so one is a T, one is a B. And what the, how did we get there? We actually got there from our own few millions at WRI. In my own experience at WRI, we've been discussing our own endowment and how should we manage our own endowment. And there was a huge um, set of um, research and work that went into looking at our own endowment, which is in the millions, unfortunately not in billions and trillions yet. And how can we uh, use that to also leverage other endowment foundations to uh, get interested in these areas? And that is when we realized there's a real big problem with supply, so it wasn't just a question of being interested, and that's why I think the things that we heard about, and Professor um, Faust talked about this, you need the next generation of the kids who are going to Harvard and to other schools, frankly, who will be creating these new uh, ventures. Uh, hopefully people in this room, people who are not in this room, but also this next generation, because what we found is that there has been a sequencing. What happens is money managers make a lot of money, and that's great investing across everything. After that, after retirement or whatever, then there is an interest in um, climate or whatever. So what we're trying to do is to see how we can bring that, the two sides of life together. Similarly, many foundations, I chaired the investment committee at Ford while I was on the board, where there's the asset side and there is the investment side. And how can you bring these together? There's very interesting discussions going on and frankly, I've been more interested in the positive versus the negative conversations. And, um, and so 
the way we got to this millions to trillions was really looking at our own endowment and how we can get it to be where we would like it to be, how we can leverage it, and then how do we use our research and collaboration across the board with all the different groups to get other groups interested in this area. I'll just touch upon two other things, Andrew, which are worth talking about, at least uh, based on my own experience. We're talking about emerging markets here, but you know, right on our own soil, there is Hawaii Island. Hawaii is using 90% hydrocarbons. And right now, its big goal is to go to 70% hydrocarbons in 20 years. That's the big goal. So I think as we're talking to emerging markets, and I used to run, as Andrew said, among other things, I started the natural gas group and ran new renewables at the bank a very long time ago when these topics were really not exciting. And we know how much solar energy there is in the world. And, you know, we've been talking about that today. We know uh, wind power and so on and so forth. And at the same time, within hydrocarbons, there's a lot of potential to go from less um, uh, less intensive uh, to more intensive. And so you want to maybe move from coal to uh, natural gas as there are many, many emerging markets that are investing, that have uh, investable projects in uh, natural gas that could be used for combined cycle power and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of um, uh, opportunities in my day job at uh, Rock Creek where we're looking at these kinds of investments, but I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion uh, this afternoon and to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Afsani. That was terrific. Somebody this morning mentioned the sharing economy, and you notice that we are doing it with the chairs uh, in this session right now. So when the music stops, I'm not sure which of us won't have, won't have a chair. Uh, we now turn to uh, Nancy Fund, who is managing partner at DBL Investors. Uh, and their goal is, quote, to bring the power of venture capital to promote social change and environmental improvement. Doesn't get any better than that. Um, Nancy is on the board of Solar City, by Bright Source Energy, Primus Power, and was on the board of, of Tesla. Um, Fortune magazine uh, uh, said that she was number 17 in the top 25 eco-innovators in the world. So I, I don't know whether the other 16 are here, but I tell you, that's, uh, that's quite something. She's also author of a, a famous report on the history of U.S. energy subsidies entitled, What Would Jefferson Do?, which uh, we all should read, I think. Nancy, come and tell us what's on your mind. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to the State Department, to Secretary Kerry and his team for inviting me. And I've just had a wonderful day of discussions and learnings. Um, so we we are a venture capital firm. Uh, we, we do we're not concessionary, as as Peter mentioned. We need to make market rates of return or better for our investors. But we also feel that we can drive social progr progress across the world and, and environmental improvement. And we we've been fortunate in that we've been doing this now for almost 12 years. We we were able to get a start. We did get Ford, MacArthur, Annie Casey. We got pension funds. We got uh, banks to support us in the early days. Uh, and the, the good news is that now we, have a, we can show that this, this approach actually works, and I, I hope that we've been able to set the stage for these large efforts that, that Peter and others are, are talking about. Um, and so uh, we don't want to rest on our laurels. I mean, we've had some great wins, uh, companies like Tesla and, and SolarCity and such, um, and we always want to keep working it. And so what we have decided to do, and we're going to be making an announcement at a White House conference on Thursday about this, is we're going to um, move to an international platform, not exclusively, and, and we're, we're still, you know, we're a very local firm in, in the Bay Area. But we felt that it was important, the learnings we've had over the past 12 years have have led us to conclude that now is the right time. And so we're going to be announcing um, our first investment in, in Africa um, later this week. So I hope you'll, you'll, you'll uh, tune in on, on Twitter. Uh, so I want to just talk a few minutes about why now, uh, why the de developing world, and what is it that we've learned along the way that makes us feel that this is going to be a, a very successful effort. And, and so when, to be a successful venture capitalist, you have to have uh, pattern recognition skills across what seem to be completely unrelated sectors. So bear with me when I give you the path that we have taken to, to get to um, 
in, investing in, in uh, clean tech in the developing world. So it all, this is kind of a timeline. I'm sorry, it's, it's not that legible. I'll just walk you through it. This is kind of um, 10 or 12 years of our existence and what was it in our investment approach that, that got us to, to Africa today? Uh, well, that 10 years ago, the, the Tesla investment, really that was sort of a jump off the cliff. Can, can, you, can one company actually orient, reorient the world toward um, clean transportation rather than fossil based? That was the bet. And, and then would anyone pay over $100,000 for an electric vehicle? Those, those were some of the, nine, the nagging questions when we made the investment. Worked out okay. Uh, definitely, uh, we, we see Tesla not only as a successful financial investment, but as one that has reoriented, helped to reorient the world towards um, EVs. Uh, in uh, a footnote in that investment was that we saw the power of ion lithium storage and its ability to transform um, uh, any kind of an energy environment. And so that's, that's something that we're taking with us, that learning uh, into, into our African investment. Um, another investment we made during that period was in a company called Revolution Foods that serves healthy lunches to low-income school children. And I know you're wondering why on earth is that relevant <laughs> to, to this subject. But again, remember pattern recognition, super important. We saw back in 2005 that uh, the universities, uh, the government uh, researchers, foundation research researchers had done a tremendously great job identifying the problem of, of too much sugar, too much junk food in our, in our nation's youth, and that this was becoming an epidemic, that, that the fact that school lunches were, were not healthy was contributing to the first generation of, of kids in our, in our country that may not live as long as their parents, in part because of poor nutrition in schools. And so we just said, okay, the not-for-profit world, the academic literature is there, it's time for the entrepreneurial economy to scale a solution. We don't need to study this anymore. We don't need moms and pops. We don't need non-scalable grants. We need a private sector approach. And so um, we started with one little charter school in downtown Oakland serving about 10 meals a day. And now Revolution Foods serves over a million meals a week across our country and is creating thousands of quality jobs along the way. And so this, this the reason this is important in attracting people to invest in new areas in clean tech today is that it, sh it really demonstrates that there is a time when studying a problem and developing data has to morph into applying private sector and entrepreneurial principles to get things done. Because even if you're the Gates Foundation, you can't write a grant for serving a million meals a week to every school in, in the country forever. I mean, that's just not the role of, of that sector. So that was a super important learning for us. Then we got into our solar phase. We um, power light, bright source, um, solar city really showed us a, a lot of lessons about the transfer from mom and pop to to uh, national um, uh, organized, sophisticated uh, companies. Uh, we also made an investment in a company called Mayette, which is in the fashion world, but is directing uh, its attention to artisans in the developing world that don't get paid enough, don't get training, uh, and often live in areas of conflict. And so we, we, Mayette is developing an approach to solve that and pay people better, get them trained. Hindu and Muslim women work together in Varanasi uh, weaving silk and, and, and feeding their families and reducing conflict. And this gets covered in Vogue magazine. It's New York Fashion Week. It's, it's very scalable. It's very um, Western in its ability to satisfy uh, the need for ethical couture, but also to make a thriving business that hires a lot of people. So that was one of our, that was a, a, another lesson in terms of the importance of entrepreneurship in the developing world. Then our company, Solar City, invested in a company called Off Grid Electric. You heard Xavier Helgeson this morning, just a, a phenomenal entrepreneur. We said, wow, Solar City's doing that. Um, it must really be um, ready, this, this is, the time is, is, is at hand to do this. And then Solar City, just a few months ago, bought a company in Mexico as part of a Latin American expansion. So all this, this journey um, really has led us to say, okay, it's, this is the time. It wasn't the time 10 years ago, uh, but, but it is the time now. And so um, 
we're, we'll be making this announcement on Thursday and, and really represents a huge milestone for us and I hope will serve as our other exam, ex, uh, investments have served as examples for others. I hope this will help attract more attention to the space. And I just want to close real quickly with why is this important from a, a kind of financial point of view. Um, this is, this is a, a stunning uh, comparison. I used to be a securities analyst before I was a venture capitalist. And what, what this does, so that's kind of what informed me to make this chart. This shows Tesla and Solar City that are about a decade old um, and compares their market capitalization, which is kind of a, the way the market views the future of an industry and of a company in terms of what, what its stock price is today. It compares Tesla to one of its incumbent uh, competitors, General Motors, and Solar City to one of its incumbents, Pacific Gas and Electric, one of the largest investor-owned utilities in our country. And it's just stunning because these companies are a decade old, Tesla and Solar City, whereas GM and PG&E are 100 years old. They're, they're, they have been around since the early 1900s. And yet, look at the market cap in, um, in, by, in comparison of the decade old and the century old especially in Tesla, over half the market cap of, of, of its uh, incumbent um, GM and Solar City uh, getting to be a big chunk of, of um, PG&E's. What this shows us is that not only does this matter from a point of view of climate, but it matters in the world's financial markets. It matters that we are developing the iconic clean energy versions of, of a 21st century economy that we all know and love from the 20th century and that there is this passing of the baton. And so this is an opportunity kind of once in a lifetime that we believe will will now be expanding to areas of the world that truly need uh, not just clean energy, but the, the energy in the first place that allows them to have a way of life that um, you know, is sustaining and that um, we can be proud to pass on to future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, very much indeed. And the notion of passing the baton is a very powerful one. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we turn uh, finally to Glenn Prickett, who is the Chief External Affairs Officer at the Nature Conservancy. Obviously, TNC has uh, more experience of bringing private funding to the service of uh, the natural world and conservation than, than I guess almost anybody in terms of a long-term track record. Um, Glenn joined, uh, I guess, in uh, 2010, and before that, he'd spent 13 years with Conservation International, which in, in really innovated amazingly uh, under yours and others' leadership with regard to bringing private investors to the place. And um, uh, he's going to talk about something that, that not much has been done about. Uh, a lot of innovative financing comes to the energy sector. Um, uh, a little bit comes to the rural sector, forests and red and so on. But so far, one of the great needs is, is adaptation to climate change. It's actually been quite hard to think about how do we actually innovate there, and he's going to tell us how to do it. Thank you, Glenn. <clears throat> well, thank you, Andrew, and it's a pleasure to bat clean up for all of you. Um, I want to um, add my thanks to Secretary Kerry and his whole team here at the State Department. It's really been an energizing day, as Andrew said, and I think a lot of that has to do not just with the great people in the room, but the leadership that the State Department and the U.S. government has shown over the last few years to help bring all nations to Paris really ready to commit to some practical solutions to climate change. So I think that's a lot of the energy here today. And in that spirit, as Andrew said, I just want to uh, close us today in terms of our presentations by putting uh, an idea on the table that we haven't talked much about, um, and that's that nature itself is a vital solution to climate change and that we can finance nature's climate solutions in ways that generate economic returns to investors. Um, so I'll give an example of that that we're working on now in the Seychelles regarding adaptation. But first, let me just say a word about the underlying idea. So what, am I, what do I mean by nature as a climate solution? Uh, well, as you heard from Andrew, first, nature can take 25 percent or more of our greenhouse gas emissions out of the atmosphere if we manage it well. That means preventing deforestation, restoring forests, improving agriculture, and other very practical um, measures on the land. Um, in fact, if we don't pursue those uh, natural carbon solutions, we probably can't reach the two-degree target that the world has set. 
Um, but it's not just mitigation, it's also adaptation. Um, and nature uh, protects communities against extreme weather. Essentially, that means that healthy forests, wetlands, reefs, seagrass beds are natural infrastructure that communities can use to protect people and assets from storm surge, from sea level rise, from floods, and from droughts. Um, now, TNC works on projects like this all around the world, and the good news is that they deliver economic returns locally, aside from their global climate benefits. But the practices tend to be novel, therefore they're risky, and they require some innovative financial structures to actually uh, uh, put in place and deliver returns. So as Andrew mentioned, TNC has a 60-plus year track record of putting private and public capital to work for better land management. So we we're taking that expertise and really trying to innovate some new financial models uh, for nature solutions for climate and other problems. Uh, two years ago, we partnered with J.P. Morgan Chase to create a new entity called NatureVest. Essentially, it's a small merchant bank within the Nature Conservancy um, that we're using to raise impact capital and deploy it against nature solutions. So let me tell you about one of those uh, projects that we're working on now uh, that's a climate solution for adaptation, the first ever debt for adaptation swap that we're helping the government of the Seychelles implement. Um, Seychelles is an island nation. Uh, more appropriately, it's a nation of islands, 115 islands in the western Indian Ocean off the shore of East Africa. Um, as a low-lying uh, nation, it's very vulnerable to climate change, sea level rise, and storm surge. Not only its people, uh, but its economy. Over half of the economy of the Seychelles comes from tuna fishing and from tourism. And if Seychelles loses its coral reefs, if it, if it loses its mangroves and its shorelines, it loses that, those economic assets. Uh, so President James Michel of the Seychelles is, one of, is a leader globally in calling for action on climate change, but he's also working very hard in his country to prepare the nation to make it more resilient to climate change. Uh, he knows he needs to invest in that natural infrastructure, those mangrove forests, those coral reefs to maintain his economy and his people. Um, but as a highly indebted nation, he is very cash constrained in terms of his ability to take money from his treasury and invest it in natural infrastructure. So the novel structure we've come up with is a debt for adaptation swap. Um, essentially, the Nature Conservancy uh, has raised an initial $31 million in impact capital. Eight million, essentially, in equity grants from a number of charitable foundations, um, the Grantham Trust, which is represented here today by Jeremy Grantham and Ramsey Ravenel, thank you very much, um, the Waite Foundation and the Oak Foundation. Uh, and TNC, through NatureVest, is putting in a $23 million uh, uh, debt capital alone. So the, the bundle, the $31 million, we are lending uh, onto the government of the Seychelles through a new uh, independent local intermediary. Um, the government of the Seychelles is using that $31 million to buy back about $33 million um, in public debt uh, from Paris Club creditors, uh, the first ever debt for nature swap negotiated through the Paris Club um, at about a 5% discount. Um, and through the financial engineering that goes along with that, we're able to extend the maturity of the restructured debt uh, so that the government of the Seychelles will be able to make our investment whole. They'll repay that $23 million loan with interest and still have about $13 million to put into conservation activities, about five of it in a permanent trust fund to ensure that this can be managed in perpetuity, um, and another uh, eight or so million that will be available over the next 20 years for ongoing expenses for managing their coasts. Um, so what does this uh, deal buy us? It has already achieved the first ever marine spatial plan uh, of an island nation. We call them great ocean states. 99% uh, of the Seychelles is ocean. So they've got an area of about one and a half million square kilometers of ocean that they've now planned and zoned with all the stakeholders at the table. Uh, and a third of that, an area about the size of Germany, they're putting into a marine protected area to protect the most vulnerable coastlines and the most important coral reef systems that maintain the health of the fishery. Um, and they'll now have permanent funding over time to be able to manage that area uh, effectively. Um, so we're really excited about this deal. It's a big priority for the government of the Seychelles. Uh, we're expecting to close it and announce it at Paris, uh, at the COP. Um, and we're excited to give it visibility for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the world talks a lot about uh, mitigating climate change, which is absolutely essential, but many of the developing countries will come to Paris with a real priority around adaptation, and they're, they're going to want to know what all of us who are mobilizing climate finance can do for adaptation. So we're excited about this as a model that generates 
economic returns, uh, and we're also looking to replicate it uh, with governments around the world. So we're already in discussions with about a half a dozen other island nations to replicate the model, and we think there's at least a billion dollars worth of uh, potential uh, for this model to drive a good conservation and, and climate adaptation for people and nature all around the world. So um, thanks for listening. Love to talk to you about these uh, nature's climate solutions during the Q&A and after the conference. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. Well, there you have it. Um, I want to open the floor as soon as anybody wants to ask any questions or make any comments, please just raise your hand and we'll pass the microphones around. Um, while, while you're wait, waiting for that, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Um, first, I'd like to ask you, um, President Faust, uh, I mean, clearly Harvard is doing just some remarkable things. You just listened to, to, what, to what you said about that. I mean, I assume students now are are more alive on this issue than ever. Tell us about the faculty, though. I mean, uh, I, I, are you seeing research uh, sort of growing and deepening? And you have a fund now that you allocate. I mean, I'd be interested to know how you allocate that fund. You allocate it for research in certain areas. Uh, is there a lot of competition? And just say a word about that. <clears throat> I think is equally passionate, uh, and so it's a, a, a shared endeavor between faculty and students to engage more fully in issues around climate change and also adaptation, a lot of interest in that. The fund is something we created last year. We're in the middle of a capital campaign, and I wanted to insert this as a priority um, area within the campaign, and it was meant to draw the attention of philanthropic support, but also offer the kind of advance for ideas that might be just germinating and need a little boost before they could get other kinds of funding or supporting um, uh, areas that seem too wild or ambitious in some ways to make a case to a traditional funder. We have a group of faculty that um, supervise the, uh, have been the evaluators of these grants under the Vice Provost for Research. And so this has been the first round of funding. We funded seven projects in the first round that um, range pretty widely from dealing with food waste to dealing with temperature, impact of temperature, and how to mitigate imp impact of temperature on the elderly. That came out of the School of Public Health. And we are very excited to see the widespread interest. And we'll see how the second round goes. But I think it will only grow as we um, make it better known and as people see that actually things are possible to, to win one of these and to be able to advance your goals. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm looking around, by the way. Please feel free to, to raise your hand. I'd like to ask a question of the, of the sort of three, you happen to be sitting in the middle, the three, the three of you, uh, Peter, Afsani, and Nancy, who manage money. Um, uh, you know, there they used to be a view, and it still exists, that if you take environmental issues into account, you may have to pay a bit of a sacrifice in your rate of return. Whereas other people would say, if you don't take environmental risks into account, you're, you're just crazy because that makes sense uh, to do so from, a, from a, uh, a sort of a rate of return standpoint. Now, obviously, there are all kinds of issues associated with externalities. Do you feel, as we look, for example, at, you know, last week, I guess, uh, you know, Al Gore and David Blood had the 10th anniversary of their fund and, uh, you know, they're in the top 5% of funds. And they would say, look, I mean, the, the point is being made. Uh, if you don't take environmental issues into account, you're, you're just not a good investor. Is the war, is the battle being won intellectually on that? Um, or are fund managers around the world still saying, look, if we choose to limit the amount of companies that we're able to invest in, surely we will have to pay a price. <clears throat> Well, I can, I can speak. We just raised um, our third fund, which is a $400 million uh, impact fund. It's the largest impact venture fund in, in the country. And uh, we, we had those kinds of discussions, and we were able to get endowments and, and lots and lots of foundations into the fund. And it really, we framed it as an innovation cycle. Um, you know, forget about the, the campus clashes and the students outside your door. But just think about, you know, what if you had held on to Wang Computer or Digital Electric Corporation, you know, when the PC was, was and, and minis and such, and, and eventually Apple came out. You would not have done well for your endowment, obviously. You, you need to invest across innovation cycles in order to do your job. Well, what's happening in energy is an innovation cycle. It's just, 
it hasn't happened in so long that no one recognizes it because we've all sort of for 100 years had our grandfather's electricity industry and now actually things are changing and it's your job <coughs> to kind of right, understand that you need to rebalance your portfolio. It has nothing to do with protesters. It has to do with uh, your fiduciary responsibility. And, and so in a, in, you can kind of skirt whether you divest or, 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 or not, but you, you need to rebalance. And so that's, mm. that's been, um, that, that, that was part of our success is in just putting it in those terms and recognizing that this is a, a tremendously positive uh, um, development, that we're having an innovation cycle in a sector of our economy that is so essential. Thank you very much. If, I, if I could add a word. Um, what I find is we're investing in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, we're investing in India, we're investing in China, and when you look through all the energy efficiency things that we're investing, the rate of return is as good as any other project. So if investors are looking, let's say today in the market, in public markets, let's say, you know, seven to 10 percent, that's very positive returns, by the way, for this year. Um, you can potentially get those kinds of returns, and I'm sure Peter will have something to say about that. Similarly, in private investments or other investments, and that's just one area related to what we're talking about today. So I'm a big believer, you know, in, if you look at the combined cycle power plants that are using natural gas versus coal, by definition, in a lot of emerging markets, they have local energy, they have the uh, much more efficient uh, power plants, and just connecting those two things together provides a lot of, um, you know, cheaper energy for them at the market price. I think there is an issue though, Andrew, in the sense that I think the group, the numbers of people who are out there who believe in this are increasing dramatically, literally in the last year even, I would say. And before that there was much less enthusiasm, it was far fewer people who were real, real believers. But everyone is getting educated. So whether it's education at the university, whether it's education through you know, public policy, through foundations, through institutes, it's really necessary because many, many people out there are doing it more like a marketing thing because now the Pope is talking about it and everybody else is talking about it. So it's uh, maybe I should know about it, they, but are they truly convinced? So I think turning it into something that is really part of what we're talking about is really important. Last but not least, when we all studied economics, it was capital plus labor, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else was kind of externality, as you just said. Mm -hmm. Today, when, uh, when the leader in uh, Beijing comes and says that you know, he's signing off and he had the big ceremony here in Washington with President Obama, it wasn't just sort of a political issue. You can't breathe the air in Beijing. When we all go to Beijing, we try to stay the minimum number of hours that we can stay there. His own family, his own children, you know, everyone who's in leadership there is trying to get into Hong Kong, which is not that much greater, but better, and outside, right? So how many Chinese friends do you have who bring their kids out? So that's not an, air is no longer an externality. Water is short in supply, and you've done many studies on aqueducts and other things. Oh, so these that what we as traditional eco uh, economics, you know, learn to be externalities are now very much starting to get a true pricing. Yeah. Good point. Thank, Thank you, the, Peter. The reason why the aligned intermediary exists is because there is a demand from large investors, the large global investors, the most significant holders of capital in the world to really get that money to work in these sectors. So we, we were not out selling to try to was really coming from the investors trying to find ways to participate and, and to work through the mechanics because it's, it's hard to deploy capital responsibly and living up to your fiduciary responsibilities and all the things that have to be done. It's, it's a very complicated business. Yeah. So the deals have to be structured correctly and that's where there's a lot of friction in the system. It's people yeah. want to do the right things and more capital is being allocated. But how you really can structure transactions, structure product, so that those investors can make those investments. And I think that's really the next phase of where we need to get. And, and there's so much, there's such a diversity of, of, of supply. I mean, I love the, the Seychelles um, debt swap, which addresses ad adaptation. Um, in, in our portfolio, we have an adaptation investment, it's SpaceX, because we figure if we really mess up here and we all have to leave Earth, <laughs> we have a rocket to go to Mars. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? But I mean, there, there's so there's really a huge um, spectrum of opportunity that's because, that suits a variety of investor needs. That's really interesting. J just on the um, 
think you, several of people today have mentioned impact investing or, or uh, uh, social entrepreneurship. I, I assume, but tell me if it's true, that in the Harvard Business School, for example, that notion that I might go into the business world and actually now try and do something that makes the world a better place, that is, that is a bigger thing than it would have been 20 years ago, is that right? Absolutely, and we have one of the most vibrant hubs of environmental scholarship and teaching at Harvard is at the business school. Um, Rebecca Henderson, Forrest mm. Brown Park, those names may be known. Some of you are really working out on the kind of business case level what you all are talking about on the investment level. Uh, Nancy, your, your comments about what kind of world do we anticipate and how, and your comments, Asane. Rebecca Henderson has worked on what what kind of scenario planning should businesses be doing when they project into the future? At least one scenario has to include um, serious environmental crisis. Another scenario is averting serious environmental crisis. That makes what is the sensible, profitable path look quite different than if you don't take those kinds of assumptions into account. So trying to embed those anal analytics in how individuals think about structuring business plans and, and strategic plans is very much a part of how she teaches and thinks about her work. So I think we see a number of manifestations of how do we join our business enterprises with the kinds of considerations that, as you were saying, Afsane, are no longer externalities. Um, I would just, I would just um, take it one step, step further that I think that today's students, as this builds <coughs> momentum, I don't think they're going to accept anything but. I mean, I think it's kind of, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You do need to mine the planet as you mm. make your yeah. investment returns. That's great. Thank you very much. A question down here. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name is Ramsey Ravenel. I'm with the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment in Boston. Um, I had a question for President Faust. Um, in your comments, um, you you didn't address the endowment uh, at, at Harvard, um, which is at $37 billion, give or take, one of the largest out there of its kind. Um, and I'm, I noticed that uh, earlier this year you had 350.org and various others um, camped outside your office and applying, doing their thing, rabble-rousing and putting pressure. Um, uh, I would be interested in your comments on what that experience was like for you and and what you might see and in, in some of what you might have heard here today um, how uh, what are your thoughts about the opportunities for the for HMC and managing the endowment to think uh, a little more uh, or be more explicit I should say perhaps in thinking about the real risks to its portfolio with its existing assets uh, on the one side maybe a, a defensive strategy what might we, we be missing? What are our vulnerabilities to some of these? Uh, the, the, the downside to the, the, the disruption that, that Nancy's described and Amat referenced earlier, the 4% utilization of cars, if people find a clever way to solve that problem, that's a big disruption to a lot of incumbents. Um, so there's a defense side and then there's an offense side to say, be investing in that innovation cycle so that um, you're not caught flat-footed and aren't, aren't missing those opportunities. Um, and I know it's, it's HMC's job to look after that, but um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on how um, you and your position as president of the university can encourage them to be thinking about mm -hmm. those issues in the context of the endowment. Those have Thank indeed you. been big issues on the Harvard campus with um, students demanding group of students demanding that Harvard divest from all fossil fuels, which we have declined to do. Um, I see a, a kind of a bifurcation of issues here, and HMC is absolutely thinking in the ways you're describing, which is how do we anticipate what the next best investment is going to be, and as Nancy described it, it's going to be in industries that are changing very dramatically as they recognize carbon risk and, and where the um, concerns about the environment are going and what we all need to do as citizens of the world. This is expressed in part through requiring you know, ESG principles. What are uh, firms doing in terms of revealing their carbon risk? We have been very engaged in pursuing that kind of information as investors, and I think that is a very significant dimension of, um, of the HMC uh, commitment. We were the first university to 
to join the UN PRI. We um, are in the Carbon Disclosure Organization. We um, are very involved with SASB standards. So there are a lot of areas in which we're trying to discern what the changing investment climate means. And um, uh, non-concessionary investments are, uh, I think, a really important opportunity for, for us all to consider as we move forward. What the students have asked for is that we divest in order to, in their language, stigmatize the fossil fuel companies. I don't see the responsibility or um, role of universities be to try to use endowment resources as political instruments. I think that's dangerous because what other political causes are we going to decide to use them for or mm -hmm. not use them for? And so I have resisted that use. Uh, <coughs> Anticipation that it's important to transform the energy industry, not to stigmatize it. And so how do we move forward in ways that can bring um, the kinds of investments that, that mm -hmm. have been described here as advancing um, the climate agenda, but not see ourselves, universities being explicitly meant to be non-political entities, taking our endowment to use it in Thank you. Other questions down here? Do we have a microphone? <coughs> Somebody bring? Thanks. President Faust, I'd like to compliment you for what you just said, because it's not only a political issue, it's also a technical issue. Uh, if you were to have an impractical decision, and some, some people have taken that decision that coal is bad, or fossil fuel is bad. There's a problem, there's a base load requirement. The entire renewable energy program falls flat in many countries without a base load. So I must compliment you for having taken the bold step to be able to withstand that kind of a pressure. But I just wanted to uh, ask you whether you run one of the world's finest universities and you're a historian. If we look back in history, do you think consumerism, as we are seeing it grow in the whole world, is something that uh, universities should also be taking to the children, to the next generation, as one of the concerns of climate change? And what will be the impact if we allow this runaway consumerism in the years to come of waste becoming the cause for even more destruction? That's a, uh, <laughs> Great a question. question. Wow. I, let me respond to it in an equally uh, cosmic way, which is um, we've not had a discussion explicitly about consumerism and its future, but I hope we have had and will continue to have the kinds of conversations about what are our responsibilities to one another as citizens of this nation and of the world, what is our responsibility to the planet, and lots of arguments among the very diverse constituencies that make up a university about what that means. I think a, a shared assumption and a shared set of values that we have as universities a very special relationship to the future. Mm -hmm. That so many parts uh, and so many parts of our world, so many institutions are necessarily or conventionally very present oriented. Universities have to be about the long term, both the history and the future. And so how can we use that assignment in a, in a manner that challenges people to think about the implications mm -hmm. of what you've described and how it fits within a basic set of values of respect for one another and respect for one another? I, I would just say that the, the venture capital in, is, industry is all over this. I mean, there it's one of the hottest sectors out there is the circular economy, the sharing economy, that positively rejects the notion that you have to buy everything new and that and you have to own everything you can have instead of owning xyz you can have xyz as a service or you can uh, take your clothes and instead of them going to landfill you can sell them online and keep them in the economy for multiple generations and this is a very exciting area we're, we're invested in three or four companies in this and, and i mean it's so i think it's it's a fascinating transition and it gets at some of these issues about consumerism and the notion that we, you know, we have to own uh, everything that we use. So I think it's really powerful. I, I would say that, just on your other comment, that it, it isn't actually 
um, always the case that you need coal or, or uh, fossil as a baseline. I mean, there's, there's certainly all kinds of projections out there that w when renewables are coupled with storage and with demand response, you can develop very robust grids that obviate the need for those. But then affordability becomes the casualty. Exactly. Well, you have the to good balance news, everything. The good news is that the cost curves are coming down dramatically <laughs> across renewables and, and storage. And while it's not possible in some places today, it, it increasingly will be over the next decade. Yeah, yeah, your, point, your point about sort of consumption behavior is a really good one. And one of the nice things about the new sustainable development goals is that that is addressed very specifically in SDG 12. Um, and SDG, the target SDG 12.3 uh, is food loss and waste, uh, which says between now and 2030, food loss and waste will be halved. And I mean, it was really wonderful that within a week, I mean, I'm not saying there was a coincidence or anything, the United States government announced a target to halve food loss and waste by 2030, which is wonderful. We're just um, working because uh, the World Resource Institute has, uh, has generally been the keeper of what's called the greenhouse gas protocol. You know, how do you measure mm -hmm. greenhouse gases? So we're now doing one on how do you measure food loss and waste? Mm -hmm. Because the world at the moment is very analogous to where we, on food loss and waste, to where we were on greenhouse gas emissions 10 years ago, where everyone was saying, I'm reducing my greenhouse gases, but they had a totally different way of measuring it to the, the other, someone else. And so we've now agreed with Consumer Goods Forum, with FAO, with UNEP, with Tesco, with uh, various other, Walmart, that to put together a sort of a way of measuring food loss and waste. And it's, it's going to be a very exciting thing. But the circular economy, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. You go to Davos now and you talk to the metals and mining people and there's sort of this sense that, you know, we're not, we should get rid of this word extractive as an industry because 20 years from now we're not going to be extracting so much. We're going to be reusing it and recycling it in a, in a, in a very exciting sort of closed loop. Um, uh, which, we're approaching the end. Is there one more question? Otherwise, I want to ask one of Glenn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you gave a wonderful example on, on adaptation. Um, but the plain fact of the matter is, it is harder, isn't it, on adaptation and in getting resilience to get that leverage mm -hmm. of small amounts of public or philanthropic funds to, 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 with, with private funds. I mean, at, at one level, I mean, obviously, the private sector adapts naturally. I mean, otherwise, they couldn't survive. So every day, every year, the private sector is adapting. But the problem is the pace of change is so great, they can't, they can't adapt quickly enough. We're just bringing out a report on, on SMEs and adaptation. If only we could find a way of channeling funds to small and medium enterprises, it could make all the difference. But it's very, very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sort of broader insights on the funding of it? Well, thanks, Andrew. I think a couple of things. Sometimes I think we divide things up too finely and, and we kind of lose the plot. So one, one thing we're doing at the Nature Conservancy and the, and the entity I mentioned, NatureVest, is very focused on this, is thinking about nature as infrastructure delivering a variety of economic and social benefits and you can stack those benefits on top of one another. So, for example, we're beginning to do a lot of work in cities in this country and around the world. Nature does a lot of things for cities that we take for granted. And if we think about it as infrastructure, and we do the science to really prove out specifically from an engineering standpoint, how can you invest in nature to deliver those benefits, you get a pretty wide range of economic values. So nature helps secure water supplies. Nature helps to reduce urban heat island effect. Nature helps reduce local air pollution. Nature helps to protect coastlines. Oh, yes, and it also takes carbon out of the atmosphere. So if you stack a lot of these benefits, we call them ecosystem services, from these natural infrastructure solutions, you can often get to a better economic return than if you say, oh, this is just an adaptation project or this is just a, I don't know, a carbon mitigation project. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's one sort of technical financial answer to it. Um, but I also wanted to come back to the consumption question as well. It's something we think a lot about at the Nature Conservancy broadly about how do we reconnect people back to the impact of their behaviors and to their connection to the natural world. Um, and earlier, one of the panels mentioned um, the younger generation. I, I love that word, the, uh, the centennials, and, and I've got a few of them myself, so I, I, I sympathize and identify. Um, and yes, they all have devices. And we did some research at the Nature Conservancy in this country a few years ago and found that 80% of kids are on their devices every day. It's probably a lot more by now. Um, and only 40% actually get out in nature even once a week, and that includes a community park. So we see a big part of the challenge. Yes, we have to educate people about limiting behavior, but we also have to help people 
see the impact of their behavior and in a positive way, understand how they're connected to nature, that that's where they get their water, that's where they get their clean air, that's what's going to defend them against climate change, and to really think through the impact of their behavior on those natural systems that they depend on. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we now have reached uh, the end of uh, this session and this day in the State Department. Thank you, Andrew, uh, and Melanie, Ned, the, you guys in the State Department. This is really fantastic. And your partners, uh, Google and, and Georgetown University. It's been a really great day. Look forward to tomorrow. I'd also like to thank this, uh, this wonderful uh, panel, uh, Drew, Peter, Afsani, uh, Nancy, uh, and Glenn, for, for really sort of um, uh, uh, ending this afternoon in a really inspiring way. Thank you very much indeed. Let's give them a round of applause.